Hey, I'm Stephen Woodford from the YouTube channel Rationality Rules, and this is my argument against circumcision. On October 2nd, 2012, a guest on Jenny Brookie's Insight was asked why she had her new baby boy circumcised. For me, it was about keeping up with the family tradition. Um, we've had everyone circumcised uh, from generations and, and generations and it's something that I don't even think about. It's something that had to happen and um, it's something that we've discussed before. You know, we got married and it's something out of respect to my family. And she wasn't the only guest on the show to respond in this way. My grandfather, my father, my brother are all circumcised. My boyfriend was circumcised. Most of the men I know are circumcised. It is in our culture and We've actually spoken with our son and we've told him. We've said that, you know, your father, your grandfather and all them, they were all circumcised. It's, it's, it's a tradition that we've had all along through, throughout our history. If your kid's not circumcised within the Turkish community, and I can only speak for the Turkish community, there may be our casting of it as well. It's part of our culture that you become a man. It's what my family's always done. So there's that part of your culture, is it a culture? Yeah, yeah. In one era, you know, it was very fashionable to do and, and now it's much less so, so... And is that justification for doing something that may hurt a child? So, it's a, we do, we're undecided. Male circumcision is one of the oldest and most common surgical procedures in history. And even today, the World Health Organization estimates that 30% of males worldwide have been circumcised. It's an extremely common practice within Muslim-majority countries, having a prevalence as high as 99.7% in Afghanistan and 98% in Turkey. But, in contrast, it's an uncommon practice within European countries, being as low as 1.8% in Denmark and 2% in Finland. However, in other first world countries, such as the United States, Australia and Canada, its prevalence is much higher, being 77% in the US, 32% in Australia and 31.9% in Canada. Now, since males are born with foreskin, the burden of proof is on those who assert that it should be removed. And so what arguments exactly do they offer? Well, there are two types given. The first is one from religion, culture, and tradition, like the ones we've just heard from Brookie's guests. And the second is one from a medical and health perspective. Let's examine the former first. With exception to Sabina's appeal to religion, all of the arguments shown so far have been direct appeals to tradition and culture, with the essential thesis being, baby boys should be circumcised because it's a social norm. However, the problem with this logic is that it's the embodiment of the appeal to tradition fallacy. Also known as appeal to antiquity and appeal to common practice, this fallacy occurs when someone asserts that something is correct or moral because it correlates with past or present traditions which, in a nutshell, precisely describes the vast majority of arguments for circumcision, and it raises the immediate question. Is that justification for doing something that may hurt a child? To address this question, and to demonstrate why arguments from tradition are flawed, let's take such reasoning to its logical conclusion. In the fertile lands of West Papua New Guinea, the Dane tribe has a tradition in which females must, by compulsion, have segments of their fingers cut off as a way of displaying grief at funeral ceremonies. Now, does the fact that this is their culture really justify them forcing, via the threat of being outcast or worse, women and young girls to have segments of their fingers amputated? Or to provide a few slightly more relatable examples, is it perfectly fine for Muslim-majority countries to cut off the clitoris of baby girls because it's what they've always done? Or is it morally acceptable for Saudi Arabians to stone homosexuals to death simply because it's part of their culture? Or, and to apply this logic to history, shouldn't we bring back slavery? As after all, it's our historical tradition, our ancestors' way of life, and what we did for generations and generations. It was, for the longest time, a social norm. <laughs> okay, these examples are getting absurd now. But here's the thing, the logic hasn't. It's exactly the same. And that's why arguments from tradition simply aren't good enough. Just as tradition doesn't justify the enslavement of people, the oppression of homosexuals, the genital mutilation of little girls, or the compulsory amputation of fingers, nor does it justify the genital mutilation of little boys. 
Now, some smart cookies will object to these examples by saying that, unlike these traditions, circumcision doesn't negatively impact the recipient's life. However, even if we accept this assertion, it doesn't validate arguments from tradition, but rather, it asserts that anything can be enforced on a baby just so long as the results don't negatively impact its life, which is horribly subjective, and it would mean that forcing other body modifications, such as piercings, stretches, tattoos, and scarification, is also morally permissible. So let's now move on to the medical arguments for circumcision. What are they? Well, while there are claims that circumcision improves hygiene, decreases the risk of urinary tract infections, and entirely removes the risk of phimosis, the most prominent argument is that circumcision dramatically reduces the risk of penile cancer, and it significantly reduces the risk of HIV. Let's start with penile cancer. First and foremost, did you even know that this cancer existed? Most people don't, and there's a very good reason for this. It's extremely rare. Anyhow, the assertion that proponents make is that, according to the Journal of American Academy of Dermatology, circumcision has been shown to reduce the lifetime risk of penile cancer, but due to subsequent studies contradicting it, medical authorities have since dismissed it entirely. For example, to quote the American Cancer Society, the protective effect of circumcision was no longer seen after factors like smegma and phimosis were taken into account, and hence, this claim is controversial at best. Furthermore, according to the National Center of Biotechnology Information, the lifetime risk of developing penile cancer in the US, where an estimated 77% are circumcised, is 1 in 1,437. And the lifetime risk of developing penile cancer in Denmark, where only 1.8% are circumcised, is 1 in 1,694. And so, again, we have compelling contradicting data. With this acknowledged, even if it were true that circumcision can indeed reduce the lifetime risk of penile cancer, and even if the largely intact Danish didn't have lower rates of penile cancer than the largely circumcised US, would this seriously justify subjecting all newborn Danish boys to circumcision? If so, by using exactly the same logic, we could easily also conclude that all babies should have an appendectomy at birth and that all females should additionally have the tissue that will eventually develop into their breast buds removed. After all, the average American has a 7.3% chance of developing a life-threatening case of appendicitis within their lifetime, but we could reduce this chance to 0% if we remove the appendix at birth. Similarly, the average American woman has a 12.4% chance of developing breast cancer within her lifetime, but we could reduce this chance significantly if we remove the breast bud tissue at birth. These aren't of course perfect examples, but if a 1 in 1694 chance of developing penile cancer justifies circumcision, then a 1 in 14 chance of developing appendicitis justifies an appendectomy. Sure, removing the appendix is more dangerous than removing foreskin, but the appendix is far more likely to become a health risk. So if the logic is to remove something at birth to prevent a potential illness, then this logic applies at least to the appendix. And while we're on the topic of danger, research has shown that circumcision directly causes one out of 77 male neonatal deaths in the US per year. This compares with 44 neonatal deaths from suffocation, eight from automobile accidents, and 115 from sudden infant death syndrome, otherwise known as cot death, which all rightfully arouse deep concern among parents and childcare authorities, but with the exception of circumcision. Furthermore, the vast majority of penile cancer occurs in adults, and so, unless there's an exceptional circumstance, should it not be a mature and informed man's choice on whether or not he wants to undergo surgery to reduce the chances of him developing penile cancer? This is, after all, our line of reasoning when it comes to women and breast cancer. And finally, let's address perhaps the most prominent medical argument, that circumcision significantly reduces the chances of acquiring HIV. The base of this assertion comes from the highly respected World Health Organization, who states that there is compelling evidence that male circumcision reduces the risk of heterosexually acquired HIV infection in men by approximately 60%. However, they include two very important caveats. The first is that condoms have an 80% or greater protective effect against the sexual transmission of HIV and STIs, which is to say that condoms are more effective than circumcision. And the second is that circumcision should be performed under sanitized conditions by a trained medical professional and only upon a man who can give his informed consent. 
With this said, studies do indeed show that circumcision prevents HIV in third world countries, but the same cannot be fairly said of first world countries. In the US, where, again, an estimated 77% are circumcised, the prevalence of HIV is 0.6%. But in Denmark, where, again, only 1.8% are circumcised, the prevalence of HIV is a measly 0.16%, and in Spain, where only 2% are circumcised, the prevalence of HIV is also lower than the US, being 0.42%. Now some might not present these statistics, but will instead present Egyptian statistics, where over 80% are circumcised and the prevalence of HIV is incredibly low, being just 0.01%. But to present Egyptian statistics without also presenting statistics from countries that also have high rates of circumcision, but also high rates of HIV, such as the US, would be deceptively disingenuous. The point being here is that while there are many compelling and contradicting studies and arguments both for and against circumcision, in the vast majority of cases, there simply isn't sufficient justification to condemn a baby boy to the needless and life-threatening surgery that is circumcision. And this is why not a single legitimate health organisation in the entire world recommends routine circumcision. None. Not one. To conclude, if a parent or family wants a baby boy circumcised for traditional reasons that are often disguised as medical reasons, then this isn't only logically flawed, it's morally reprehensible. Circumcision may or may not negatively affect victims, but surely, without adequate justification, this choice should and must be in the hands of an informed man when he comes of age. We're going to do a game for you called The World's Worst, whereby we stand here on the world's worst step and come up with as many examples as we can of the world's worst what, Wayne? You are doing examples of the world's worst priest or rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> well, hi, if you give me the knife for the baby, I'll give it a little cut with the height. <laughs> Jerry Lewis is the rabbi? <laughs> but the pipe is not the guy.